Hello everybody, uh, welcome back to another podcast about video games. I am right here with uh, Richard, uh, I'll be honest, I know Richard before the podcast. Uh, we are working together currently at a studio that we cannot discuss, but uh, uh, something big. Uh, hopefully in the future we could be able to discuss about that. Uh, Richard has uh, three decades of experience in game development, which makes my one decade uh, seem so small. Um, so after so many years and um, big projects, what are the main projects that were uh, most insightful for you? I suppose my first proper games project was obviously, it means a lot to me because, you know, it's what got me into games. That was Microcosm for the CD32, which nobody's ever heard of, but essentially it's a, an Amiga with a CD drive. This was the good old days. This was, um, this is when everything was assembly. So, I mean, there isn't a single line of high-level language in that game. It's 100% assembly. It's all 68,000. You, we were using, you know, coprocessor chips. There were two coprocessor chips and the CPU. In your heads, you knew how long every single instruction took. You know, if, it's a, if I needed to move some memory, it's going to be eight cycles of the base, and then how much memory I'm going to use, etc., etc. So that was really good fun, but it's, um, it's very, very different than it is now. Um, so I loved, I loved that, but I wouldn't want to do any more games in assembly because <laughs> it's crazy. Um, so I suppose, you know, my, my high level languages, I mean, the first time I ever used Unreal was in 2003. So wow. it was Unreal 2 That's and it was incredible. a game called, <laughs> and it was a game called Republic Commando, which was a Star Wars game. Um, so Unreal... At that time, they were just PC focused. They weren't really doing console. So mm -hmm. I took the, the renderer and optimized it for Xbox. So that was fun because that was sort of taking big amount of other people's code, then optimizing it. And then I ended up meeting Tim Sweeney and, you know, talking to him at, um, at a Microsoft show and stuff like that. So, but I mean, if you're talking my, my favorite thing I've probably ever worked on, it's probably going to be we ported Viva Piñata, which was a big Xbox game, to the PC. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done, um, but it was so fulfilling because the game, loved the game. Um, I just started going out with my partner. Um, her daughter loved the game, so she was incredibly excited that I was working on it. And I got them in the credits. <laughs> so when you finish the game, um, everybody could choose yeah, like a little animal. Yeah. yeah, everybody could choose like an animal. So as well as having their names, they could have an animal like come on the screen and do stuff. So that was crazy. We had to like emulate how console hardware was working, um, like 360 to PC. Um, I was defreading code, which was crazy. Um, so that was really good fun. Let's go modern times. So how was it to be introduced to VR after 20 years or so? Uh, developing games like on screens. So funnily enough, in 1993, I went for a job at a VR company. So we're talking 19? 1993, Whoa. 30 years ago. It was, um, it's this old, if you look back in time at virtuality VR, it was this, it, it ran at like 15 frames a second. You felt ever so slightly sick using it. <laughs> Um, and they had these like crazy games, but you know, that was the first time I looked at VR. Yeah, Ghostbusters. Um, I, w I had my own company, um, very much like you, I used to side contract. So I got offered this job, do you want to do Ghostbusters? So I said, yeah, of course. <laughs> so yeah, so basically that was, um, there was a company in New York um, that had the license and they were doing the bulk of the work and essentially binary bubbles, um, which is me and a couple of other people who you know, we were bought out by another company. Um, yeah, I did all the programming. One of the others did a lot of technical art and uh, the other one was working on design. So, I mean, that was all done in Unity, which is my favorite platform. I know Unity, we got it done in a very short amount of time. Um, but it was really fun because, you know, we got some film assets to work on. It's a, so, you know, we, we got to see stuff that was going to be coming out in the new Ghostbusters film. Ivan Reitman, who directed the original Ghostbusters, he was on the, the panel of people who was, you know, playing it every single time we did builds. So, of course, you know, you didn't want to let them down, etc. So, yeah, it was really good fun. Uh, Patton Oswald, um, who's an American comedian, 
he was a voice of one of the characters and it had never been done before. So it was really good fun. I really, I really enjoyed doing it. I played with VR before, but never done a project. And we literally did it in three to four months. Oh, so, that's amazing. Yeah. That's insane. <laughs> and it's PSVR. So, you know, getting draw calls down. So, yeah, massive amounts of um Yeah, I can imagine. Because <laughs> it, it all ran at 60 frames. I mean, it never, ever dropped below 60. So that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the uh, Tato Legends uh, on the Xbox. What was your role in Tato or uh, the Xbox? Do you know who... Ni what's his name? Nicola... Almora, I can't remember his name, um, mm. but essentially he's the guy that invented main. So he sat next to me. <laughs> um, so essentially we had the guy that invented main. He wrote, we were using all of his cores, but of course nothing was particularly optimized for the, you know, the consoles. Mm -hmm. So we had a guy who was responsible for the um, PS2 and I was essentially responsible for the Xbox. We had other people as well, but they got me in because I knew how to optimize Xbox. Um, mm. So we were doing lots of crazy stuff, like um, things like when you're playing Space Invaders, um, the Space Invaders are different colors based upon where they are on the screen. Mm -hmm. But that's because they just put plastic tape up over the screen. So I had to emulate that. So we were doing crazy stuff like emulating, you know, like the way that hardware you know, non-computer hardware, but like, you know, colors that they were putting on oh, the screen. Oh, you're speaking about like... different Space Invaders 9 <laughs> Yeah, Oh, yeah, this is like Space Invaders from the 70s. Oh, um, so I am not familiar. Yeah, and then except for that, I mean, we were, um, a, a lot of the hard work was getting the speed up. So PS2 had a worse time. The Xbox wasn't too bad. But we were doing lots of things like um, graphics in arcade ROMs are not only compressed, they're also encrypted. So we had to decrypt them in runtime. Um, and essentially, yeah, the, the plan was get all the games up to um, maximum frame rate. Yeah. Um, but there were like, I don't know, 20-odd 20, 20 games. Do you happen to know about uh, why Tato for the Xbox wasn't released in uh, NA? I have no idea, but if, if the... I had to guess, <laughs> I'd say it'd be a legal problem. It was probably... So quite often with games, it's who owns them at any point, because whether they were made by Tato back then, somebody might have bought the rights to one of the games. So my guess is that, yeah, mm -hmm. somebody owned the rights and then they just weren't allowed to later release it. Uh, were there any features or game modes that you wanted to include? Like if you had input? There was no scope for doing, uh, you know, any of your own stuff. I mean, when I had my own company, it was funny. Well, not funny, it was fun because <laughs> we didn't particularly think about the money. We just thought more about making, you know, some fun, do whatever I wanted um, and quite often did. When we did Microcosm, another team did the Japanese version, which was paid for by another company. I think it's Fujitsu. And then we basically got all of the assets and then we were told you can do exactly what you want and customize it and make it good for your target hardware. So we did what we wanted. We, mm -hmm. we didn't use any of the music. Um, we completely rebuilt how we were going to handle the gameplay. Um, we added different gameplay concepts we had a maze we had some different bosses in um the original music was very sort of 70s and spacey and we put in full-on early 90s dance music <laughs> um, because we were allowed to do it they were yeah. quite happy and then as, as as you sort of go started going into like the mid 90s and the late 90s it became a lot more corporate led you will do it like this, yeah, except you're there was, there was stuck in your box and yeah. this is what you do. <laughs> and yeah, by the time it got to 2000, I had very little input on any games. Let's see, I have so many questions here. I did my <clears> research. That's okay. I've got plenty of beer. I could be here for a while. <laughs> no, me too. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. So, uh, let's go uh, Xbox 360. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell us about uh, your role in development of uh, Blood Forge? So Blood Forge, that was a, that was a crazy one. Um, so that's Unreal. Um, that's Unreal 3. That would have been the... Was it your first time? I, I, uh, I'd work, no, I'd worked on I'd worked on Unreal 3 game literally as Unreal 3 came out. Um, where I was doing technical work um, for a PS3 game. 
uh, never got released, but we were doing crazy stuff. I mean, we had, um, you could shoot at the walls and bits of plaster would come off. And then if you shot it enough, you'd see the underlying, um, like, brickwork and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we were doing proper destruction physics and everything like that. And this, that was 2006. Ooh. So so by the time we got to, like, 2010, doing Blood Forge, I had to take a version of the game that was 18 months old and port it to the newer version of Unreal. That took six weeks oh, just yeah. to do that. Back then, yeah. Yeah, it was, over 10, 000, it was over 10,000 errors. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, nobody else wanted to touch it, but I'm a contractor, so I'll take yeah. it on. So, um, so I did it, and I got it, I got it all working. And then they're just like, do you, want to, um, do you want to carry on being a technical programmer? So I said, yeah, all right. So a lot of the stuff I was doing was, again, um, Unreal's great at generally doing stuff. But it wasn't great at doing certain things. So what I would do is I would take the things it wasn't great at, write a new system to deal with it, and then the game ran a lot faster. To so that's things systems? like so mostly animation and mm -hmm. shaders. So when you were making shaders um, back in the day, you know, like 10, 15 years ago, the automated systems weren't brilliant. They were okay. They did mm -hmm. an okay job. But you could do a much better job if you if you knew the sort of things that you were going to render. You could hard code the support for that, and then write a custom system to deal with that. And we were literally, you know, the shaders would be, you know, eighty percent, seventy percent of what they would be if Unreal created them. Oh, so yeah. we did that. Yeah. Uh, we had crazy amounts of animation um, going on, and we were doing lots of stuff with. Um, this is pre God of War and all these games. We were doing, you know, limb removals, legs. You could cut them off. You'd see mm. the insides. So it's dealing with all the optimizations to make sure that you're not rendering all the extra stuff that you need to mm. and things yeah. like that. So, so yeah, so I, I did a lot of work on that. Basically, my job was make sure the game runs as fast as possible. I can't, I can't tell you what the computers I used then were, but um, I do remember a game I did for this company before that was the Viva Pinata port. Mm -hmm. And because it was so intense dealing with um, the systems, um, they had to get me a water-cooled PC. We, we just had to overclock everything. I had RAID hard drives because we had so much data, um, basically, you know, process, that you just had to have an incredibly expensive computer. And I was contracting, so they basically would, you know, get me this computer and ship it to my house. <laughs> yeah. And I could barely lift it. It was so <laughs> heavy. Um, and yeah, it's the same then. I mean, we had 360 dev systems, which actually weren't very big. They were fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, back then, I don't know what my PC was, but it's not comparable to what you have nowadays. Uh, so Bloodforge was praised for its uh, art style and visual design. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk about the process of creating the game's aesthetic? We were very excessive on um, screen effects. So one, we had a lot of blood going on. Um, but we actually, rather than just go sprite for blood, you know, we were actually starting to try and make, you know, not complete 3D meshes with gloopiness, but, you know, at least we were trying to create something that we knew would look good so that if you were doing a, a hit, it would look like the blood was sloshing from all the places. So we'd make sure all the particle systems and the yeah. things like that were um, uh, facing it. I know we did a lot of work on um, the color correction. So when you were rendering, if you took the color correction off, it looked like a different game because we'll be using lots of stuff like film grain and things like that. It was so easy to set this stuff up in Unreal. All you would do is you just say to the artist, show me how you want it to look, go crazy, and then we'd see if we could optimize it in any way. So you'd do lots of stuff like, you know, they might have a film grain and some color correction and then maybe a couple of other things going on like heat case. And they might have that as three different layers and what we would do is we'd do it as a single pass and then get the speed up. they start off, it'd be slow, get the look they want, we optimize it down. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I mean, it was, it was for Microsoft, I think, in the end, that game. And yeah, they seem quite happy with it. But often when I get onto engines, etc., cetera, um, I will learn how the different systems work so that then I can not be... We essentially call it being an expert in the area. So I will learn a particle system just so that when an artist says, I want to do this, I can go, hey, this is how you do it. Mm -hmm. So I remember we did set up a lot of 
um, sort of placement effect. So we'd say, okay, this is how you do a slash effect, and this is how you this is how you set up a you know um, god raise, etc. So we'd set them up knowing they'd be in some way optimal, or at least be you know a lot better to run, and then we'd pass them off to the artists. Um, but we had a lot of really good artists. And they did a, a huge amount of research into, you know, the look they wanted. And of course, you know, it's things like Conan the Barbarian and, you know, films like that. They were uh, they were trying mm -hmm. to mimic the levels. Because, you know, we're talking, what, 15 years ago we started working on this. You'd literally, you would just run around the game and then we stream what you need in the background. Unreal had just about got this working. Yeah. And I remember we had to, you know, deal with the issues. Um, but yeah, we got it going and it was so cool. Being able to run around the level properly mm -hmm. without loading screens. And the, uh, the industry, uh, I might actually have to pull this uh, info up. Uh, how long do video games exist? How far do you want to go back? Uh, so, like from the first commercial time? video games, mm -hmm. probably Pong. So, you're talking what, 71, 72? My age is such that I remember them. I can remember going to an airport with my parents when I was about five which would have been 1974, and I remember seeing Pong machines, and they were crazy looking, it was like a big yellow lozenge sort of thing, and I remember being incredibly excited by them. And, you know, when, when you could start to get um, games consoles at home, I had an Atari VCS oh. 2600, mm -hmm. so I got one of those in 1978 when I was nine, and then, yeah, that was when I really, you know, started to realise, yeah, I like games. I never <laughs> thought I'd work in it still. Yeah, it just comes uh, yeah. as a side of I mean, there are, just I mean, there are games. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are games that go back to the sixties. Yeah. Um, it's like um, tennis for two. There's a couple of other games. I mean, they were just used as exercises for programmers mm -hmm. to um, sort of, you know, just try things out. Yeah. Um, but then in the UK, very early eighties, sort of like 1981 onwards, really, um, is when the games industry really started getting big over here. Mm -hmm. Started in bedrooms and then setting up small companies. So, like, uh, in 30 years, what was your favorite title? Uh, favorite title? What? Favorite title I've worked on that I, got released? Yeah, like, what you enjoyed the most? I'll rephrase my uh, question. I loved, I, I loved working on Viva Piñata. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you know the company Rare? Uh, no. So Rare started out on the end. Well, they actually started out on early early machines in the early eighties, um, and then essentially they started doing Nintendo stuff um, in the sort of late eighties, early nineties. They did a lot of famous games. I mean, Banjo Kazooie is one of theirs. Perfect Dark, things like that. Oh, this um, and then they did Skate with a Pinata. Um, and then when I, I basically was evaluating the game for this client. And then my agreement was, if I got them the, <laughs> if I got them the gig, then they'd let me work on it, and <laughs> we got the gig. But it was great. We went, we went up to see Rare, amazing place to work. I mean, we we turned up and like you know they were they were having a barbecue, um, so we we joined in the barbecue, and yeah, it was really good yeah. fun. It was it was just fun working with the technology because I mean I don't think anybody had really done this sort of stuff before. I mean it's you had a play area and the play area is completely deformable so mm -hmm. you can you know you can dig things up you can plow things you can essentially you know change it around as you like um and on the xbox that was all done with specialized hardware yeah so it's this deformable play area um we use shade i use shader tricks um i used a lot of um sort of multi-threaded programming so that you know i could offload some of the work to the other threads so that was that was really good fun i mean that was that was hard work to get yeah. that going but, um that was really worthwhile so the art style looks amazing um i love this uh stylized color that was also yeah. so so back in the day then you had to do your own shaders so nowadays with you know, Unreal, Unity, mm -hmm. they'll make all the shaders for you. You know, yeah. you, you build them up, they build all the have a node, versions. have uh, a convenient node graph and you just... Yeah. Tuck, 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 so not know. anymore, not yeah. these days. So <laughs> in these days, you have to create all the shaders yourself. <laughs> all in HLSL or GLSL or were you like yeah. extending base? Uh... 
No, so essentially you'd, you'd want to build an HLSL shader, mm-hmm. but you can't make 60-odd thousand of them. So you wrote a program to make them for you. Yes. Um, and then you'd know that the optimizers would never get you quite what you wanted. So you would try and pre-optimize it yourself, you know, use, use some tricks. So going to uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, which was a very <laughs> popular show back in the day. Um, we also had in Israel our version of it. So what got you into that? Were you excited um, like a, as a popular uh, show? Did you like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Do you like trivia no. games? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't particularly like the program. I worked on that game for a month. <laughs> um, and yeah, because I did quite well on the first project, I just kept on doing projects for them. One day they're just like, oh, we got this um, Who Wants a million, Millionaire contract. Can you have a look? And it was using a render engine that um, was doing okay, but not good enough. So essentially my job was just to optimize it down, get the memory down, get it sped up and things like that. So let's talk about the Spider-Man PC VR. So when I used to live in America, um, I had two flatmates who shared a house together. And one of them had a games company and they, they got the contract to do Ghostbusters so that I contracted for them. And then when we started doing Spider-Man, that was when I started to join them permanently and became their um, technical director. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so that was sort of, that's, you know, getting to know the people a lot more. Um, and then obviously I'm still with them because they're at Pure Imagination. It was the same company doing it as um, Ghostbusters, yeah. but this time they demanded that we do it in Unreal. Oh, um, so that was fine, but I hadn't <laughs> used Unreal 4 before. So I had to learn Unreal 4, but you know, you can pick up Unreal pretty quickly. <laughs> so yeah, so it's Unreal 4. Um, we had very little time to do it. So it's yeah. 100% blueprint. Um, it's not a single line of C++. Oh my God, really? That yeah. seems very unoptimized. <laughs> yep. So the trick, the trick there was, what can you do to optimize the blueprint? I used every trick I could find um, <laughs> to just get those blueprints down. We had hundreds of... Like- uh, was there even native? You can native the blueprint to like some. Sort you could, of, yeah. you could. But this was back in the day where if you wanted to um, convert it to native, you had to rebuild the Etsy. So it was too slow. Yeah. Um, they were in the company making it were in New York. My other directors are in LA. I'm here in Plymouth in England. We just mm-hmm. couldn't do it. It was um, it was just way too complex to be having. Uh, you know, to worry about the build process. So we just said, we're going to do it all in Blueprint. Just use every trick I could think of. Practically nothing had a tick event. We would just use master controllers to deal with all of their events if they needed to. And in the end, we still had huge amounts of objects, huge amounts of physics. Um, There was a lot of um, pre-canned animations going on that you could interact with. And it still ran at 60 on a PSVR. Um, never be put off on it by anything. Um, I've taken on contracts where I pretty much knew I couldn't do them, but I did them anyway, because you can learn. That worked absolutely fine. I'd never used Unreal 4 when I came to do Spider-Man, and I got it working very, very quickly because I'd used Unreal 3 before. I knew basic concepts. I just hadn't yeah. used the updated version, so I knew I could do it. I'd never blag. I, knew I would never, if I know I can't do it in my heart, I would yeah. take it on. But, you know, there's a few games here, you know, I've, there's some DS, I worked on some DS games. I knew nothing mm-hmm. about the DS. They said, do you think you can do it? And I said, yes. <laughs> and they gave me the hardware manuals and they gave me the kits. And I just basically sat down for a week and learned how to do it. And I mean, nowadays, you know, it's so easy with engines, you just get on with it. I mean, it's... Mm-hmm. But everybody also, so many go, technologies right? and so many, yeah. like, branches to engines, that, like, you have different systems inside an engine. Yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm 50, I'm, you know, coming up 54, and I'm still learning stuff. I'm now getting into AI and using it as my, you know... Oh, amazing. <laughs> co-pilot. Beautiful things the, going on. The project there. we're on, um, I wrote, you know, there's a tool that I use for part of it, as you know. And it just got to a point where it's just getting too slow to deal with stuff. And I knew how to fix it, but I didn't know a proper way of doing it. I asked ChatGPT and it showed me two different techniques and I tried them and they worked. Yeah. I mean, it's, 
you know, it's just like, um, you know, you've got to know, you've got to know what to search for and how to integrate it, yeah. but this that's is... going to become less important over time. I don't think there's going to be the jobs in 10 years time, just because, you know, we're not going to need junior programmers anymore. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, but it's knowing, you know, it's, I think it's going to be a lot more important to know the technologies. Yeah, rather know than how to the, ask from uh, GPT, yeah. like know how to create the prompts. I think there are going to be like jobs specifically for that. Absolutely. That's what I think it's going to be. There are going to be people, there are going to be people that know how to implement concepts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they will know ChatGPT will be doing some of their work or whatever else, Copilot or whatever other AI system. But you've got to know how to put it together. I mean, there are, there are literally plugins now in Unreal, um, Unity, where you can say things like um, put 20 cubes in a scene, um, equally space them out, give them random colors. You just oh, speak yeah, it. I saw that one. It's built in, integrated in the, yeah. like a console, small console, and it yeah. randomizes them. But sometimes it crashes. Yeah. I saw that. I think I saw yeah. the same uh, uh, video. But there are so, there are so many, um, there, there are so <laughs> many, you know, I, I call it, you used to call it bread and butter work. It's just the stuff that you have to do. It's boring, but you just have to just yeah, do it. You can there just are so many things you have to set up. And if I can just tell an AI to do it for me and I can go, you know, I'll set, um, you know, add, add a light, make it the sunlight, um, single bounce, indirect, blah, blah, blah. You know, if you can just be saying stuff while you're programming. And um, also be crazy you know, because he knows your uh, previous prompts and he takes yeah. information from that and knows exactly what you're doing. So this yeah. is like... And I think the big thing is it's not, you don't just want it so that it's typed. I mean, I want it so that I can be typing code away and I can tell it to do something. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, that's, I think that's going to be the way we're going to go. But and yeah, I think if anybody wants to get into programming, etc., learn the systems, learn how to use unity, learn how to use unreal. I think the concept of writing code and just a language and writing your own bit of graphics engine code to run a bit of graphics. I just don't see any point in that mm -hmm. anymore. I mean, I had to do it back in the day because, you know, there was no other choice. But nowadays, yeah. do it for a bit of fun. But except for that, if you really want to make stuff, mm -hmm. use an engine yeah, and learn AI. I totally agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I just want to ask, uh, I know you were uh, playing around with Midjourney before. Um, how do you I haven't played this? it yet. I, ah, you did? I literally, no. So mm -hmm. I've, just, I've just paid for proper chat gpt mm. and i'm starting to use it a lot yeah. more now for my programming work and then i thought mm, i suppose i should have a look at mid-journey you, you so should. i you literally should. just started you yesterday should. this is my favorite uh uh, di uh, uh diffusion generator like uh, it's called yeah. the stable diffusion ai uh, something in that terms uh so you have like multiple other choices but mid-journey is my favorite along them yeah, uh, yeah I, i've had a look at a couple of the others and i was not massively impressed. Yeah. Um, yeah. What I want to see, what I really want to see from mid journey is it's stuff that I'm want. So can I get it to create game assets? Oh, so, so I use it right now in my project. Yeah, I don't mm -hmm. have concept artists. I just use uh, mid journey. Um, yeah. My 3d artist. Have you seen, have you seen the systems like mid journey that can create 3d models as well? So I heard something about uh, Nvidia did uh, before mid journey yeah. came out, they started working on something. I don't know if, it's gonna come out, or it, uh, it works. Or... I've seen, I've seen oh. the white paper write up for it. Oh it works. My God. <laughs> this is so... something like when that comes out, I'm, I'm not gonna work at any other job. I'm just gonna focus on my project. But that's, but that's, what I, uh... what I want is something like I can make an image in Mid Journey, and then I can go into like Chat GPT and say, I want this as a sprite. So mm -hmm. I need you to um, add alpha. And I want it to have this amount of edge on it and this sort of fall off. And, you know, honestly, that stuff isn't very far away. Yeah. No. So that's, that's why I'm interested in it. Yeah, it's insane how technology just leaps forward. I didn't envisage how things were going to, you know, go at the moment. I thought we were way away from this level of AI. But, you know, yeah. here we are. <laughs> that's insane. So uh, I have actually one more question. <laughs> yep, go on. If something... Like demotivate you over time? Like, do you get bored? So, so I got my first computer when I was 11, 12. Um, my dad, um, this is back in the days when you couldn't even particularly buy computers. You'd buy the parts 
and then he'd have to make the computer. Mm-hmm. So my dad bought the parts, and he got his friend, who was an electrician, to make the computer for me. <laughs> yeah. um, so basically what you're talking is, from the age of 12 to now, it's been my hobby. So essentially, I am paid to do my hobby. I've had times when I've not worked between contracts. Um, I've been laid off a couple of times, uh, and I've worked for other companies. And what did I do after I was laid off? I'd write games for myself. I mean, I got the um, I I bought into the original Oculus um, VR system. Mm-hmm. I also had um, the DK One though back in the day when it just came out. Yeah. Yeah. I got I've got a DK One and a DK Two. I don't really have any need for them. I just sort of messed around with them. But yeah. I'm glad I did because then when I got the VR contracts, I at and least had experience. a basic exactly. idea yeah. of um, <laughs> how to get it going. <laughs> but yeah, I never I never get bored. Um, <laughs> of that. course, yeah. So Richard. Uh, Thank you so much for being a guest uh, in the podcast. Thank you, everybody, for watching the show. If you want more episodes like this one, make sure you subscribe, leave a like, and maybe comment down below. See you guys.